Christmas ornament demos. Now, say you don't do Christmas ornaments. You slice wood, you cut wood, do you spin stuff, do you sand it, do you feel it? If you do that, Trey's going to show you how to do that. So Trey's going to start one in just a few minutes. And then around half an hour from now or so, uh, Dane's got another demonstration on tap for us. This one going a little bit longer. We're going to go to the epoxy world and talk about that. And we have a few other things to chat about this evening. Um, but that's uh, in, a, in a kiss, that's what's happening. I do have two re requests in here. Um, somebody's looking for Bob Moffett, M-O-F-F-E-T. Bob, put your contact information in the uh, in the chat, please. So no, and uh, I'm going to come to my co-host there, uh, Ron. Ron, can you mute out everybody? I cannot get that to come up on my screen tonight. Did Ron get that? Okay. Uh, unmute me. And I'm back in here now. So that keeps the, the jump from happening when we go on. We have lots of tips on board from our wood turning members and our team members. Um, we did get a nice promotion from Stephen Ogle. Uh, he did a YouTube. It's up, I think yesterday it went up uh, from his shop. And he talked about worldwide wood turners and what we're doing. Just this, just like that. I've also heard this week from Vince Welch at Vince of Wooden Wonders. He's going to be on board. Um, our, get this, we now have an executive director of membership services in our group. <laughs> he's, he's, he's on, he's, he's with us tonight, uh, the uh, executive director of membership services. Uh, there you go. That, that's him right there. That's him. Yeah, there you go. Everybody, everybody that's online tonight, look and see a lot of y'all are in the dark, meaning you have to turn your video on. You might be able to see us, but we can't see you. So we, we'd like to be able to see you, and we'd like for you to uh, show us what you're doing. And the only way you can show us is if you turn your video on. If you, if you look at yourself, if you're in black with just your name there, you got to turn your video on. Let's see if you if you got clothes on. I mean, if you, you know, the other way around, I'd rather not. There you go. All right. I see they John. Made a country, they made a country music song about that one time, didn't they? Turn your video on. Turn your video on. Oh, my goodness. we got to get some controls <laughs> on this singing on, on the air thing. Uh, I think that was turn your radio on. Oh, all right. <laughs> All right, here's a test. Here's a test. Age test. Do you remember the ashtray in the back of the bench seat that your folks sat in in the car when y'all went for a drive? Yeah, I remember that. The ashtray yeah. in the back seat. You betcha. You remember the dimmer switch, dimmer switch on the floor? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You'll completely confuse yep. the wheels today. How about the start before uh, seatbelts were invented? Yeah. Didn't have any in our old Studebaker. No seat belts. Uh, no, that, that was, you know. Three speed on the columns. Yep. 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 Three, yep. three on the tree. Starter, starter button on the floor. Yes. Yep. I remember that, that starter button on the floor. Oh, that and the dimmer problem. switch. Okay. That, I, you know, we're old. Come on. Leave it alone. I was in a class at John Campbell. And... <laughs> Most of them were about our age. There's one young lady that was in the class, and they were redoing a camper. And she said, "Well, it had these awful green appliances in it. It had this green, stringy carpet." And every one of us said, "Avocado green." That's what, that was it. I had an avocado green refrigerator. The shag time. carpet. <laughs> I didn't go all the way to shag, but okay. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Kim, are those donuts you're eating here tonight? Um, see Kim's in with us. Trey, are you in with the park? Because I can't find you yet. Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, I'm, I'm trying. You got to me. Um, I do have a show and tell. I want to add something I did this week. Oh, I can do that. That's it. I made you a co-host, and now I'm going to go back up and put you in spotlight. 
And what is your show and tell this week? Speaker? Can't I'm hear you. A, okay. Let, I made a visualizer for small, small hollow forms. And here's what it looks like up on the screen. You can see it oh, up there. No, we went to your screensaver. I'm looking at scenery. Looks like a squirrel to me. Yeah, oh, looking nice. Aren't you looking at a picture of the, just a no, second. Sir. No, we're, we're in your screensaver. My computer's done something. I see now. This is the kind of work you're doing. It's really your hollow form is beautiful inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, we have never got the running water thing worked out. Um, I don't know. I need to get out of the screensaver. Let me get out of here. All right, we'll still be I'll here. I'll get back to you. I'll figure I out. Need how to the in the bottom of that bowl. <laughs> there's, a, there's a polar bear in there and a walrus. And now we're getting dizzy. Now they're backwards. Yeah, I'm okay. to the walrus. I got, I got a problem getting him there to uh, to release that program he had to release. Okay. All right, now we'll get back to it again. Um, okay, a little while ago, because Trey's getting back online with us, a little while ago I mentioned the Christmas tree Christmas tree ornament demonstration that Trey is going to do for us. We have a actual challenge up right now. It's our ornament challenge. Uh, it's going to run through the 1st of November. The details are in a newsletter, which is on our website, worldwidewoodturners.org. Um, and the details are pretty simple. You turn an ornament, whatever you want to turn, whatever shape, color, size, inside out, outside in, whatever you want, because it's wide open. Whatever you want, turn an ornament and submit the photograph of that ornament to us via our web, our email address. Yes, send it to, if you send it any other way, I'm not gonna see it. I got a guy tonight from 2010165, I'm sorry, 2810165, sent me some beautiful photographs. Who are you? Who are you? Um, I, but he sent it by messenger and I can't do that. Um, but you send me an, a picture of an ornament and we put you in the challenge. The only condition, and this is a major condition, you have to be willing to give it away. You don't get to keep it. You got to find a kid, a grandkid, a great grandkid, a neighbor's kid, kid across the street, whatever. You have to give it away. We have to share our work, and this is the way to do it. So we have that ornament challenge going on. Trey, are you back with us yet? I'm back. So does I'm the wife count? Can you hear me? It depends on how, how young you married. Yes, sir. We're back with you again. We're going to go to gallery review and see if I can okay. pop you up here. For uh, you. I made a, a little mini visualizer. And let me plug it in and I'll show you what it looks like. It's just with a little small camera off the internet. Okay. And that's what it, that's what it can say. Hold on, it. Trey. Hold on, Trey. We bumped you out because of that conflict. It, it didn't give me you back again. Hold on. Uh, see, we went back to your screensaver again. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm there back. You now you're back. I'm, I'm back now. Um, um, well, let's see. Best view on this. Okay, see if I can get a good view on it. I made a little mini visualizer and I'm trying to find it. You're right in the middle of the board, right now, right in the middle of the board. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, um, but anyhow, I, I mounted, uh, I just used the uh, support structure that uh, comes with these uh, 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 micrometer things that you set up on it with the magnet thing. I just yeah. used the arm on it, fixed a little end to it, uh, spent $20, $25 on a camera from uh, China, and uh, works great. And I was trying to show it on the other, but it's obviously not popping up right. It's jumping to the other thing. Okay. N nifty idea, real nifty. Uh, yeah, that's, I'm not going to say it's better than. Uh, there are commercial items like that, uh, but they're very proud of them. 
Yeah, well, th this one was about 10 or $15 for the magnetic arm holder. And I already had an extra arm and another 10 or uh, 20 bucks for a camera. So I had 35 bucks in it. You see, those other guys really proud of what they're doing. Yeah, they want <laughs> 600 for it. I know that, and that's why we do this. Exactly why we do it. So, Trey, you ready to start your demo tonight? Uh, you want to go ahead and do it first? We can do oh, that. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Well, let me let me get everything. We got a full give me about we, five minutes and go ahead and do some other stuff, and then I'll be there. All right. Give me a holler when you when you're coming back. I'm going to kick that out. Um, see if it takes us so a second or so for us to kick back in. See a lot of comments come in. A lot of stuff in the chat. Um, Billy Dillard just had something up there. Um, Billy, click that Benny because I want to. I want to. Want you to explain that. Billy, I thought it was Billy Dillard. Oh, that's Not Billy. Me. That's it must one. be a different Billy. I don't. I don't Not know. Now. He I'm popped confused. up. All right, he's that the other Billy I saw just now. Um, Who me? Yeah, is that? Did you pop up with a comment on that? About the video? Nope. Wow. You know we it have. It wasn't me. I don't. I don't know. All right. I see. I see Billy. A lot of Billys in there, but it's me. not me. Okay, that's all right. We'll pass on it. You know, we we sharing our ideas. Whipped like seventy two folks, which means I have three screens that I got to look through to find folks. Uh, no big deal. We'll keep going. Um, we have some special visitors coming up in the next couple of weeks. Ronnie is putting that together. Ronnie is also the membership director. Uh, we're splitting up some duties, and we we've got a website, a web director. Um, we've got some folks handling other parts of this. Dane's organizing uh, functions for us. Um, it's uh, well, jumped all over the board there. Uh, we're jump, we're trying to get more and more lined up. So we have two lined up tonight, and I'm rambling here because I want to keep going. Um, when Dale gets back, we'll cover what Dale, I mean, Trey has got. Uh, I see Johnny is in there tonight. I'm here. All right, sir. You said you had something to show, did you? Yeah, I just had that that little uh, log there. I've got a picture of what I can put on the screen if you want. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. Wait, man, I should have put that note on here. We do want to see this. Folks, I want to tell you that, you know, we, we go looking out in the woods for stuff. And uh, Johnny did that, just that. And he came up with something really cool. And we're going to do a demonstration on this in the near future. Show us what you had, Johnny. Okay. Let me see if I can get it up here. But, uh, I got it. Let's see. Well, let me do this. I'll put it over here. Uh, there we go. That's just a little bowl coming out of a log there. The uh, natural edge, small bowl. Okay. And when when I first saw the photograph, I couldn't get a, a, an idea of the size. Um, yeah, it's, it's small. It's only, uh, I think the bowl a little over two inches there on it. And, uh, but it was a small one. That was my first one. So I wanted to start small. Uh, okay. You it. could now, see Ronnie and I stayed on, a, um, stayed on a line the other day for an hour or so talking about how you held that and how you turned it. And that's where it came from. Ronnie, Ronnie but that's the one that said, we need to get him to do a demonstration of this. Explain it. Yeah, that's the jig I used to hold it right there. The, uh, and that's basically just a piece of two by 12 or so and uh, two little brackets to hold it. All righty. Yeah. Okay. It's got my brain working. Yeah, Ronnie, you got that? Even seeing that, Johnny, I'm still trying to figure out how you turn that bowl itself. Oh, that's in, you turn that in, when I have it in that jig on the lathe, the, uh, start out, let me do this real quick. The, uh, (coughs) 
start out with you and you turn a hemisphere on the end of the log there. There you go. That's what I was telling Eddie. All right, Brian, you had it. That's it. You turn the, the little hemisphere and mm -hmm. then you put it down the jig and the lathe and you turn the bowl. So, and you that's wind exactly, up with two of them. That's exactly what I thought. And Eddie said, no, he did it. He did it with a half a log. And I, man, my mind's been spinning the whole week. <laughs> no, it's. You actually start off with the whole log or the, in this case, of the piece of camper there, a camper limb, big one. But it was, it's not as complicated as it looks, really. So. Okay. Were you the inventor of that? Pardon me? Were you the inventor of that or did you copy that? Oh, no, I copied that. I saw another one and uh, on the internet that the guy had done some time back. In fact, there's a, there's a YouTube video, and I can't remember the guy's name, that did the same thing with a small one there. So. Okay, I was on the right track, and Eddie threw me completely off when he said that was a half a piece, and that really blew my mind in. Yeah, after, like after you turn that hemisphere, then you go ahead and you I run it through the bandsaw, and then you come out with two halves, and that's what goes into that bracket that was on the lathe there. Okay. Making that bracket looks like it'd be the fun part. Yeah, it's <laughs> a little bit of a well, challenge. Bracket, you know, the bracket is actually pretty easy because what you do with it is you take a, uh, well, there's two different brackets here because one end was a different size, but you just drill a hole the size of your, uh, the bowl you're making, and then you cut it in half on the bandsaw and you get two halves. So there's your brackets. The, the bigger one goes through the end where you have the uh, the tenon there to hold it. Johnny, can we like we we have already booked you on this. We're going to get a demo from you, right? Okay, we'll do that. You see that, or Ronnie, I is going to invade your shop again. So, you know, you there you go. It. You're welcome to do that too. So. All right, thank you, Johnny. Can you try to make a bowl on both ends? Say again. They say, have you tried to make a bowl on both ends? Whoa. No. Funny, I thought about that today, though. And because uh, I did the other half today, and it doesn't have any finish on it. But I had thought about putting a bowl in the bit. So, and that's a uh, challenge there. Did that I might try for Martin just now? Yeah. Martin, was that you that came up with that? Who, who can't ask about the double bowl? Oh, that's Terry. Okay. Then what's going to happen is the edge of that paper is going to burn a line in the valley. Wait. Um, but not only is it burning the wood, it's burning the paper, it's burning the embrace. Okay. I don't know where we went with that, folks, because um, I can't follow it at all. Eddie, I, I think Stephen OG's got two pieces for us to show, show us tonight. Stephen, good evening, sir. Got to click in, Stephen. Turn off your mute. Start talking. I... Hey, how y'all doing? All right, Steve, now we got you. Yeah, I've got a black hawk flying over the house, so it's been flying over about the last week. Yeah, uh, he asked me if I would show the piece that I made in that video, and this is it. It's a, a piece of box elder. It's been sitting in the shop for quite a while. It had some bug holes that, uh, under the bark, and uh, I tried to keep all of that, but as you can see, I lost a little, little bit of the bark. But <clears throat> the knot that was in the bottom really left some really nice feathering in there, if you, I don't know if you can see that or not. Oh, yeah. That they left some really nice, really nice feathering in there. <clears throat> and, uh, but anyway, that, that was the video I put up, uh, yesterday or last night, late last night. Thank this you. is, uh, this was another one. I finished it today. Uh, it's just a natural edge walnut, but it, it was the same type crop cut as that one was. It's got, three knots all the way around 
I like doing that. They look really neat and they get pretty deep too. This one is about six, six inches deep and eight inches across. Okay. And the finish is? The finish is a desk sand and sealer and uh, men wax, uh, paste finishing wax. Okay. Thank you. And what what kind I do of for that, that Sir? What kind of wood is that? This is maple. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah. It's, it's old maple. I, uh, it came from a huge tree that got knocked down in the storm. Uh, I got one, one pickup truck load of it and it, uh, it looked like I didn't even touch it. <laughs> All right. Huge tree. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Uh, Dane, you. Can you hear anybody else in the bullpen right now? Yes, we have Jason Collin in Colorado. Jason, let's go. I know you're out there, Jason. I hear you breathing. Hey, there we are. <laughs> you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm blipping in and out, but that's okay. We can live with this. Hey, there we are. All right. Yeah, there's well, one. you're talking about the whole Christmas ornament challenge the other day, so I ended up making something. The only problem is, is my wife has already claimed it. I told you. I told you then. Hide them. <laughs> right? So it's Fogwood. And the nose is Paduke. And I actually turned the nose. I was surprised I could do that that small. But but not bad out of a piece of scrap I picked up somewhere. There's such thing as scrap. Yeah, hey, no. can you tell us what uh, what chisels you use to turn that with? Uh, most of it was uh, was it the detail gouge? So, and some of it was skew, but that's <laughs> I couldn't tell you exactly how I did it. But a little fine turning when you but, when you mastered the line and figured out how to. Do slicing cuts with a screw. That's where you get that at. Not my opinion. It's not rock solid. Oh, well, I'm what getting I better at it, but it's still a work in progress. I was wondering when you made the the nose, the carrot there, if you were using the skew to do that. Uh, detail gouge is what I was using. Oh, okay. You know, it, it, when you once you, or I see him out there, and uh, I I know he's with us. Mark Soleil's with us, right? Uh, yeah. Right now. Uh, I, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> okay. Um, but when you learn how to slice with that tool, then you're going to be happy, really, when you get those little fine slices. Uh, I understand that our first demonstrator is ready. Trey, I'm going to try to pop it back over to you. Uh, let's go to Trey. Trey is... All right, Trey, you got to unfreeze yourself or something, bud. We not, still don't get your audio. Um, I got him spotlighted. All right, now you, now you got to Trey. Unmute yourself, Trey. Apparently, we have a technical difficulty. Well, I'll just change it back to my computer. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Instead of trying to use the over over the head thing, I'll just I'm on my computer and uh, let me know if you have a problem. Okay, I'm gonna start demonstrating. Uh, this is the first of a series of demonstrations on ornaments. Um, I turn a whole lot of Christmas ornaments. Uh, when I go to my uh, annual show, I'll usually have about 1,500 that I take take with me to the show. So uh, I turn a bunch of them and uh, sell a bunch of them. Um, and, which, and what I'm going to do th today is I'm going to do spindle type ornaments. So the first time we'll, we'll do some turning on spindle ornaments just because of time. Uh, I was told 20 minutes for the demo. So I'll show you some of the spindle ornaments that I, I have normally and give you some other examples. We'll turn something. Um, next week I'll cover um, if we don't get to it this week, I'll, we'll do a multi-axis uh, tree and 
next week I'll talk about finishing and, and different, uh, different ways of putting hooks on them. Um, I have a standard way, but there's several other ways of doing it too. So um, let's start out with uh, the order. These are the ornaments that, that standard uh, spindle type ornaments that I have. Uh, it's a Nick Cook style uh, snowman, large and many. Um, I've added a snow woman to it, put a skirt on it, ro rosy cheeks, different type of hat, both large and small. Uh, little Christmas trees. Now these little trees, um, they're painted to school colors or, or in this case, uh, New Orleans Saints, but they're painted to uh, school colors and they sell very well. Um, I have a little Santa, both large and small. Um, I've got some lighthouses and I don't have, I turn one just, to, these are unfinished that I just turned um, on it, but I couldn't find any in my inventory. And then I have a few bells that I have. Like bells. And some, uh, this is a, an offset Christmas tree. And this is what I normally carry in my inventory wise. Hey Trey, to... hey Trey. Yes. On, on your Santa ornaments, are the beard is that painted on? Uh, yes. Um, the this is a, a fluff type paint that I mix with white. It's a uh, real, real thick, and I and uh, it's just a gel part that you mix with paint. That the uh, and uh, I put white on there and then put it real thick, and then I paint the paint the face, mustache, and stuff on it. Thank you. Um, and these are some things I just did this week in prep for this demo. Um, long icicle, uh, some trees, something I haven't been turning a lot of, uh, but it's a good idea, is a light bulb. Um, you can stain the top, you know, green, red, blue, and then put some metallic paint on the bottom of it. Just a simple turn, turn shape, uh, more trees, a little bell, more lighthouses, uh, another basic shape. And the purpose of, put, of throwing all these in front of you is just to give you some different ideas of some stuff that you can be doing with them. Um, uh, for spindle type turning. And we'll clean the lathe off and make some chips. Well, I really cleaned it off. Excuse me, let me get everything off the floor so I don't walk on it and trip. What kind of wood do you use? I'm using, uh, I like to use maple for this type and for, for my snow, for my Santas, uh, this is cedar. It's just a red cedar that we have here. And that's what these were roughed out with. Um, I generally like to start with a, uh, let's see, with five quarter maple stock. And we'll, Now I'm gonna right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the uh, Nick Cook style ornament uh, snowman, and it is really an excellent ornament to learn and pra and practice with because you can use different tools to do it with. Um, you can use the skew for for most of it. Um, you can use a spindle gouge on it. You can use the beating parting tool, uh, your roughing tool, and it's a good practice piece. If you mess it up, so what? Um, it, it was just a little small block of wood. You grab another one, you haven't put a lot of time into it. So 
let's let's get to turning. Um, I'm starting out with a a roughing gouge or a spindle roughing gouge. Um, I have a 40 degree grind on it. And we'll turn it on and start making some chips. I'm riding the bevel, if you can hear me, I'm riding the bevel as I'm going down on it. Okay. Oh, we have a basic shape. Let's get it a little closer. And I'll this sake, I'll go ahead and grab the skew. And all I'm doing right now is working on the hat. This is where the top of it's going to be. The peeling cut and purpose of it, just remove the wood off of it. Top of the hat brim. Okay. Now where I stand now, I've cut this. I've cut the hat down a little bit smaller because it'll look funny if it's as big as the head, bigger than the head than the brim. Cut it down a little bit. Just made two straight cuts in there with the uh, with the skew. Um, next, uh, his face has got to be a little bit smaller than uh, than this, so I'm gonna go down and just clean that area out. Now the next thing that you're concerned with, that's going to be his head. But effectively, the top of his head is up here inside the hat. So that is the center of the face. So the biggest diameter you want is right here, not, not centered on this. Otherwise, it'll look like the hat is floating over his head on it, which you don't want. So let's go ahead and uh, I grab a different chisel, but you know, it's whatever. Right there's the center of his head. And then just a slight cut right there on the side. Not much, because that's the center, that's the biggest diameter. Okay, now do something for the foot, for the bottom. Okay, now we have the basic ornament, the basic shape, of what we're trying to get. Um, you can use any tool you want on do, to do this with, though. Sanding. Taking the marks out. And then I'll use a little board um, to burn his headband in. Okay. Now I'm ready to take it off. And that's a basic Rick Kirk style ornament. 
on it. Snowman. Then it's on to the coloring and detailing. <clears throat> yep. And next week I want to cover. I want to cover finishing. I want to cover the tops and finishing. And we'll talk about finishing all the different ornaments next week. Okay. So next, next week I'll talk about the painting on the eyes on it and and some of the other stuff I do uh, with finishing. Uh, to try to keep this demo within the time frame that we have it set for. All right, great. Well, I learned a little something, and I'm sure everybody else did too. And one of the first things that you really should have been paying attention to if you missed it, especially for New Turner says, the way he presented his gouge or his, his cutter, using the bearing of the bevel to make those slice cuts, that's very important because gouges are like plows. We really don't want to be plowing our work off. So thank you, Trey. Appreciate yeah, well, it. Next well, week. I still got a couple minutes. Let me go ahead and do a um, offset trick. All right. Hey, so what, we're going to give um, Dane a heads up in 10 minutes. We're going to join our next guest. Yeah. I, okay. Um, and it starts out the same way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it in and we'll be riding the bevel. Okay, now, now this turning here, I'm gonna turn this. You saw the Christmas tree. I'm gonna turn this turning on three on three additional axes, four axes total. So, <clears throat> mark that axis that I want to put it on. Oh, Got to get back to train. Oh. Trey, we're coming back. You know, we just. Got it back? No, nope, you're on you. Okay. Story six. Story stick. I'll get that I'll let that secret out. I'm, I'm using that stick just to get some kiss, consistent measurements in it. Now the next thing I want to do is turn this on a, on, a, on a different axis. And what I'm going to use for the offset is that half in, that quarter inch offset. So I'll turn one on that on this point here. We'll turn another on this axis right here and I'll turn a third one on this axis here. So I'm putting on one of the axes, and the purpose of the color, you'll see in a second, I'm coming in, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, right now I'm gonna go ahead and do the blue ones. Next I'll do a different color when I move to the next one. Dane thought you were just getting it uh, a little bit artistic. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it to so it's easy to see where I go. I could mark them all the same and count it, but. And all I'm going to do is coming in and just do a little beat cut. Now we'll move it to a different axis. And you can see where I put that, you can see where that center part was on that one. Now the top stays on the center point. The top stays on center. The okay. bottom, I'm moving the, the bottom of the tree. 
And we'll go do the second one. I've done the orange and blue, now I'm on green. Center. Hey, Trey, we just heard from a couple of our members that this is a great use for excess pen blanks. <laughs> yes. Okay, now I have this. Now the next step. If you got the turn pens, you always know you come up with a piece that's too short to do anything with. There it is, right there. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to paint this. And we're going to do this like a cooking show. Is it? Okay, it's all painted. I can smell it, yes. <laughs> Red paint. I'll put it back on center. It dried almost instantly, too. Yes, very quick. Quick drying acrylic. I have to mention that right now we're starting a fund me account for Billy because Billy says he is uh, pen blank poor. And there you are. Now that is a nifty little piece. Um, it's offset, it's turned on four, th the four axes, but it's, you know, fairly quick, but it's a little different, it stands out. So. I'm going to give you a lot of time here. I'm going to say you did that in seven minutes. <laughs> you it, and you had to explain it while you were doing it. So, yeah, so but but anyhow, it's it's a good project. Uh, and that's the spindle type stuff. Now, next week, I'm going to cover finishing or the finishing and uh, different ways of hanging them. And right. uh, we'll conclude that for this week. Great. Thank you, Trey. Appreciate it. And You're welcome. Well, you, yes, sir. Go ahead. I think he's done that once or twice, and I just put my order in for some two by fours. All right, good two by fours or the cheap ones? <laughs> no, yeah. the good ones. The good ones. All right. Well, Mama said I can get the good ones now. <laughs> yeah, because you're gonna get to the grandkids for Christmas. All right, we we're working on some demos. This is where we want to go, folks. So I'm looking at. 82 folks in our team right now. There's 82 of you out there. You can do just like this. Now you don't have to have a fancy camera rig. You can do it with your cell phone. And real, real, hey, uh, Doug, you're out there tonight, right? Doug the Woodturner? I heard Yes, him I'm here. Yeah, there's Doug. Doug, what do you use for a high-end tool? That would be my, my, my iPhone and my... <laughs> $30 tripod from Amazon. You can't go wrong with that, really. Um, and, and I went camera, 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 camera for years. When I started with the Bayou Woodturners, I bought the first couple of cameras. And then I found surveillance cameras and I found uh, different mixes and then tape to chip and stuff like that. 
after all those years, Doug convinced me to plug in my iPhone and give it a try. And I am totally happy with what I'm getting. Now, I, I do so much of it, I'm killing my phone, but you know, it's, it, you have to learn to delete when you get, get it out of there. So here's the trick to that. Your charging cord plugged into your laptop, turned your phone into a thumb drive. So then just move the videos off your phone onto your laptop. That way you still save the videos and free up the space on your phone. Wow, the technical advice we can issue here. Wow, that's pretty good. Thank you, Doug. Dane, are you about ready with our next guest tonight? Yes, sir, we are ready to go. All right, let me mention a couple of things before we bounce up here. Um, pardon me, we're working with our webmaster right now to place these recorded programs on our website, worldwidewoodturners.org. Please get that right, because I get um, emails every day. It's worldwidewoodturners.org, and that's where we will store the photographs you send us. And we collect those all the time. The shows, the chats from the shows, uh, newsletters, all that information goes to our website, which is your website. So if you got something like that, send it on to us. And if you want to see what's been put in the chat tonight, because there's a ton of information there tonight, um, before you leave, catch that part, before you leave, click on chat, and in the lower right-hand corner, the little square with three buttons, you press that and it says save chat. Now, if you save it now, you won't read anything that happens after this, okay? But tonight, before you leave, save chat. I'll remind you about that a little bit later on. Dane, I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce who we're talking, who we're working with tonight. Okay. So, a few weeks ago, some of us had questions about casting and, and the properties and whatnot of how to do it and get the best results and everything like that. So, one of the uh, premier casters out in the casting world that supplies blanks to the various uh, pen pen warehouses and whatnot and uh, personally uh, for personal sales and, and and as a friend of mine um, and I just think he makes the, the most outstanding blanks out there um, but it's Robert Franklin he goes by Bob uh, he's out in Colorado and he has volunteered to put on a uh, demo of casting tonight I'm not sure if he's going to do uh, pin blanks or bottle stopper or, or a dragon egg type blank, but uh, those are just some of the various items that he does do. And so throughout, once I turn everything over to Bob, uh, if any of the members have questions, please put it in the chat and I will queue you up and, and ask the question uh, for Bob to answer in the background while he's working. And so he's gonna, he's gonna do his demo He's gonna, I think he's gonna go all the way through with a complete casting. And with that casting, we're gonna figure out a way uh, for the members here tonight. And some lucky member is going to be blessed with an outstanding blank or two. So with that, I am going to turn you over to Mr. Robert Franklin. Let me find him and put him on spotlight. And I think you are there, Bob. Yeah, I'm here. There you are. Well, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, much appreciated to be here. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, I've done demonstrations for the AW and um, all our local clubs around here. Uh, for you, those of you that don't know who we are, um, I'm like you said, I'm Bob Franklin. Uh, me and my wife own and operate FranklinBlanksAndCrafts.com, and uh, we. I'm a wood turner as well. A turner. And um, I'm a turner that makes blanks for turners. So kind of have to know what you guys are after to make them uh, the best that we can. And that's the best way I can go about that. But um, we, we do blanks in all sizes. Um, everything from pin blanks size uh, up. And we get into uh, big bottle stoppers and bigger even um, type pours for things like pepper mills, um, salt and pepper mills. Very nice. <clears throat> like that. 
Um, we also have an art series line that my wife works on with us, uh, with me, and she actually, we stabilize the burl and then she takes it up to her studio and builds these crazy little worlds inside. Um, for somebody to turn something awesome out of. Very nice. So it gets kind of intricate and crazy, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, most of our business is for pin turners, um, bottle stopper guys. But yeah, we get bombarded all the way through, um, which is great. And we do custom casts for people as well. Uh, so I was going to kind of do, uh, if you guys don't mind, I don't know how much time we have. Um, Dane, do you know how much time we have? Um, I think we have a little over an hour, hour and a half. Perfect. Oh, no, 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 no. And we have to disappear in about an hour. Okay. In an hour. Okay. Hour. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, if we want to do a cast, I can do a cast. The resin I'm using takes 45 minutes to set under pressure. Um, so uh, if we're going to do that, uh, I can do it right away, get it in the pressure pot. And then we can talk and we can go over the whole process and then we can go over and answer questions. And then at the end, we can pull it out and those are the blanks that we can give away uh, to whoever, however you guys want to do that. Does Great. that sound like a plan? Sounds hey, like a plan. I, I'd rather than cast something tonight, I got a little distracted just now. I'd like to see the turning and maybe we can set up another demo with you for the casting and what to go through and such and do that kind of peeing that thing, I mean, and because we do want to see some gallery from our members and take some Q&A, and sure. we don't push it to the outside edge. So, Captain Eddie, then, uh, did you say you wanted to just do the field questions tonight then, and then do a demonstration another night? I like to do the casting demonstration another evening. Okay, let's do that. So, <laughs> let's just go over the process um, and explain different resins and the safety of it, and then uh, if that works and then we can um, we can talk about all the different things that go into casting and then I can feel questions and that would eat, certainly eat up the time tonight so well yeah that helps because we've seen we've seen methods and sure. without and, and some really great explanation but we're wood turners we don't catch anything the first time so right. let, let's let's con continue along that line okay well that, that sounds like a good plan and we'll just plan on doing a demo another night for you and that works just fine for me. Uh, so the biggest thing uh, let's talk about safety and let's talk about different types of resin um, so first of all know your resin whatever you're going to use uh, there's MSDS sheets on it whoever you're getting it from has to supply them or they have to supply a link to them uh, and make sure you read them over because some of these resins are very toxic. Some of them are, um, you don't want to handle at all. Um, some of them are pretty user friendly. So it goes all the way from one extreme to the other. So just know your resin, read up on it. Uh, for tonight's main thing, uh, I use a product called um, Alumalite. Alumalite is a manufacturer. They literally have 20 different kinds of resin, uh, including epoxies, polyester resins, urethane resins, um, mold making resins, they have a whole line of them. So when somebody says alumilite, don't just go by that. You gotta find out what they're actually talking about, what type. Um, for wood turners, their urethane resin is specifically formulated for us. It's made to be machined. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful resin. It's very forgiving and it's very, um, it, it's, you're able to use it with wood, mainly material, different materials, embed objects in it. The biggest thing is that it's very moisture sensitive and whatever you're putting into it has to be completely dry. And I can tell you how to achieve that. Um, and then you will talk about stabilizing and whether it should be stabilized as well with it. So going back to the beginning a little bit, we're gonna be talking mainly about when the resin I'm using, which is, uh, it's called Alumilite Clear. There's Alumilite Clear, there's Alumilite Clear Slow. Both of those are urethane resins. Both of them have the almost exact same characteristics with the difference of 
Alumilite Clear is made for smaller casts. Alumilite Clear Slow is made for larger casts. Uh, and when I say larger, um, this pepper mill was made with Alumilite Clear. So this is the resin that's made for pin blanks and smaller stuff. And we use it for everything up to about this size. If you're gonna do a bowl blank or something bigger, then I would suggest you go to a little like clear slow. And the reason being is you have a longer work time uh, for one, and it doesn't um, set as fast. It takes longer to set. So you don't have as much problems with uh, heat cracks and um, stress cracks and things like that that can happen. When it's resin, any kind of resin when it's curing, it, uh, it, has, it has a heat transfer and that, it gets extremely hot. This will get up to about 240 degrees um, while it's curing. And if you, with a bigger cast, the bigger, the more the mass, the, the hotter it gets. And when it's starting to cool, the more prone it is to cracking. So, so use the resin that you're, you're wanting to, uh, based on your size, anything bigger than like a Pepperville blank, just use clear slow, anything smaller, then you can probably get by with a little like clear. Alumilite Clear has a seven minute work time, they say. Uh, Alumilite Clear Slow has a 14 minute work time. So factor that in too, because uh, with Alumilite Clear Slow, you can do small cast with it all day long as well. So if you need more time, if you think seven minutes, I can't do it, I'm gonna be under pressure, too much pressure, well then just get the Clear Slow because you can do pin blanks with it as well. It just takes longer. It's a 14 hour set time meaning you have 14 minutes to get it into pressure pot, under pressure. And at that point, and then you have to wait two hours to demold. That's what they say for Alumilite Clear Slow. With Alumilite Clear, it's a one hour demold, 45 minutes. Now also the heat of your shop matters too. Um, I can tell you we're in Colorado and I am, I'm in a uh, basically a garage workshop. Um, and I have a little bit of heat in here, so it stays about uh, 70 degrees in the winter and in the summer it'll get up to about 85 in my shop um, and literally the difference from 65 to 85 uh, can be in four or five minutes of work time so it, it you got to factor that in too in the summertime when it's hot I have less work time because the resin is going off faster um, because it's generating heat and it, it hits that that hot uh, zone that it that it starts curing at, and it it, it goes from there. Uh, so I can tell you about pressure pots a little bit, and we'll get into that, uh, and we'll talk about stabilizing with with vacuum with that. Um, you can't use a vacuum chamber with this type of resin. Some epoxies don't set for 24 hours, so you can literally degas them in a vacuum chamber where this resin sets so quickly, there's no way to get the gas out of it uh, in time in a vacuum chamber. So you have to use a pressure pot with it. Um, my advice to you all as wood turners is if you're trying to, to do a cast where you're building up on a piece of burl or you're building up something and you're adding on to a piece of wood, then this is the resin for you. If you're trying to fill a small void, um, say you turn a bowl and it's got a nice little crack, natural crack in it, and you want to fill that, then this is not the right resin for you. Um, in that case, I would look at, if you're trying to just fill cracks and stuff, I would do an epoxy. Uh, I personally use like a 15 minute epoxy for that because I can apply it right on my lathe or right on my turning right away. And then 15 minutes later, it's dry enough, I can turn. And you can put whatever you want in it. You can put coffee grounds or mica powders or uh, different colors that way. Um, you know, the, the world is your option as far as what to put in it to, to get to achieve cool stuff, including stone, turquoise, and um, I mean, it just serves so much you can do. But if you're trying to fill something, then look at epoxies for that. Um, if you don't have a pressure pot and you don't want to buy a pressure pot, there's other options besides this resin. You can use epoxies. Some of them are designed for casting. Um, liquid diamonds, I have liquid diamonds here. 
Uh, it's a casting resin, says right on it, for casting. And uh, you can get it through like Turner's Warehouse has it. Um, and it's a two-part resin as well. And it's, it's mixed by, by volume, not by weight. So again, you got to know your resin. Um, it's like a two to one ratio and it's okay, but is what happens is uh, anything over like a bottle stopper size, I don't like it because uh, it has a kind of a shrink factor when it's curing and a lot of times it'll pop off the burl uh, or the wood or uh, it just doesn't adhere well or you get stress cracks with bigger cracks because it cures too fast. So again, with bigger, bigger items, that's why we use this Alumalite Clear Slow. Um, uh, the other thing to know about Alumalite Clear Resin is that either Clear or Clear Slow is that it does have a shelf life. Uh, so getting it through a reputable manufacturer to ensure you're getting fresh resin is a good thing. Um, by that I mean if you buy it through Illumilite.com, you know you're going to get fresh resin. Uh, Turntex.com is my stabilization supplier, uh, Curtis Seaback, and uh, one of the best stabilizing resins on the market. And I actually order all my casting resin through him as well because I know it's going to be fresh. He goes through enough. There are some wholesalers out there that, um, you know, I know even like Woodcraft is carrying some of it now. So my question is, how long has it been sitting on Woodcraft shelf? We don't know. Um, I, I honestly, I don't know. And this has basically a one year shelf life is what they tell you. As what happens is over time is that it will, uh, side B of it will start yellowing and thicken up and you wind up having to, uh, there's things you can do to rejuvenate it um, and probably get over a year out of it, but uh, it starts getting hard to work with. And if you're trying to do a clear cast or a translucent cast, that yellowing may affect it um, as being completely clear. So something else to think about there too, is that uh, all resins will yellow over time. And that usually happens with, um, the more it's exposed to UV light. Um, so if you're doing translucence or clear, something in clear, uh, like our desk clock that I showed you, you want to try to keep it out of the sun. That desk clock was turned two years ago and it's not yellow at all, but um, if you put it out in a, in a window and sat it there for a while, you would start turning, tinting, getting, getting a yellow tint to it. Unfortunately, uh, there is some resins out there now that have UV blockers in them. Um, but again, I don't use them. I'm using one that's formulated specifically for turning and machining. And when I say machining, uh, I mean fine machining as well. So this is a pin, a kitless pin that I made. It's a one piece um, custom pin. And this is threaded. All this is threaded alumilite with caps and dies. So it takes threads wonderfully. That's how well it machines. You can get very intricate. It's great for boxes, lidded boxes for lids, um, stuff like that. Uh, let's go back to safety now again with the Alumilite Clear. So again, this is with Alumilite Clear resin, not with epoxies or anything. So typically when I'm doing a cast, um, first of all, let's talk about sensitivities. Everybody has sensitivities to different things. You all know as wood turners that my friend Mike over here might be have allergic reactions to coca bolo. Jim over here, it's, it's Paduk. Uh, you know, it's different with everybody. Uh, some people don't have any reactions. With resin, some people have reactions with breathing it. Some people have reactions with touching it. Uh, some people don't have any reactions at all until they actually um, get sensitized to it. So they build up a sensitivity over time. So that can happen as well. So it's always a good idea to wear uh, gloves, rubber gloves. I just wear nitrile gloves. I try to not get any skin contact at all. Uh, that's important for me. Uh, if you read the MSDS sheets on this resin, this particular resin, they'll tell you that uh, A side is pretty much harmless. B side, 
prolonged skin exposure is not recommended. So take that for what it's worth. But that tells me I don't want to get it on my skin. Um, I want to try to keep it off my skin. And when it's in liquid form, if you do get it on your skin, just go wash off with soap and water. It does clean off pretty easily if it's liquid. Um, the other thing is use, buying the amount of resin that you're going to use, um, again, with that shelf life. They sell it all the way from, I think, pints to 80-pound kits, which is basically 10 gallons of resin, and that's what I buy in them. Uh, obviously, the bigger quantity you buy, the cheaper you get it. Um, but you better use it within your shelf life. So keep, try to keep that in mind. Uh, going back to safety again, uh, I do typically recommend you wear a mask. Um, I wear a mask. I just use, uh, typically I'm just using a cloth mask. I'm not really, I know I don't have sensitivities and I just try not to breathe it. I usually have a fan blowing away from me running. Uh, and um, yeah, there's that. But uh, I, you know, if you really want to be safe, getting a chemical respirator would be a good thing. Uh, this resin has virtually no smell at all. The only smell, the only time I can honestly smell it is when I'm turning it. And that's if I really turn in full speed and I've got some heat building up. Um, otherwise, you really don't smell it. This resin is great for that. You can cast in your house. You're not going to stink up your house. Uh, if anybody's ever cast it with polyester resin, you know that, I mean, that stuff is just noxious. But um, so basically we have uh, epoxies, polyester resin, and urethane resins that are made for casting. Uh, most of the time, epoxies are made for a skim coat. Um, they're not really made for a deep cast. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, let's see, safety, what else? I think that covers safety pretty well. I do wear... Uh, glasses over my glasses. Uh, you don't want this stuff in your eyes at all. Um, a good friend of mine that is a resin caster as well uh, wound up with a drop in his eye when he was mixing it and $5,000 ER bill later to have an eye wash. So um, not something I want to try to do. Okay, so that was that was safety and we went over resin types already do you, does anybody have questions on safety or resin types if you do let's talk about them now yes i will talk about volume versus weight absolutely give, we'll get to that here for you. On the pressure pot with the max pressure to put them on so pressure pot wise alumilite will tell you that you need 40 pounds minimum um, I have three pressure pots. Uh, they're not really visible in the camera. Well, one is right here. This is a two and a half or a five gallon Grizzly. Um, I'll push it to 60 pounds. I have a Harbor Freight pot that was the first pot I ever started with that I won't go over 40 pounds with. And I have a 10 gallon pot down here that is certified with a stamp on it with a metal stamp that's engraved in it. Uh, to 110 pounds. The problem with these little pots is that they tell you um, that they're good, you know, they're rated to 60 pounds or rated to 80 pounds. Well, that's the guys putting a, putting a sticker on them. Nobody ever tests them, uh, these Chinese pots. They just don't. And the only way you're going to know if you're getting a pot that is, um, that is truly uh, tested is if it has a metal sticker on it and there's only a few companies like Binks and um, uh, California California air tools that actually go to that extreme um, so know your pod and just push your resin to that I can tell you this 40 pounds of pressure will do the job if I'm trying to push it push resin into say worm wormy stuff um, a wormy piece of oak or or something with a lot of tunnels and canals, uh, then I want it in my bigger pot and I would push it to 110 because I'm really trying to push resin into every cranny that's possible. Um, but 40 pounds will do the job for most of the things you guys are doing. And is what happens is to begin with, you have to realize that 
uh, we deal with a lot of things that have uh, like burrow, for example, that will have open eyes inside. So it's an open pocket um, of, a, of an eye or an open wormhole that got full, filled with frass part of the way and not the rest. So it's only open on the inside. Resin won't get into those. Uh, it's not going to fill interior voids that don't make it to the surface. So you're going to have if you're turning something like that, you're going to always have some interior holes that you're going to have to do some filling on while it's on your layer. Uh, or when you cut it, cut open it, cut into it. Um, yes, I absolutely have a blow off valves on my pressure pot. Uh, that's a must have for me and I push it to what I'm comfortable with with that pot. Uh, like I said, a Harbor Freight pot, I don't trust at all. They have very, very cheap um, quarter inch basically or five sixteenths bolts that are Chinese steel. Um, I don't for the lid. I don't really like them. On this pot, you see you have big five eighths bolts uh, that actually latch it down. I trust them a lot more. Um, and I do run uh, blow offs and I, I put it at what I think the pot should be maxed at. So my, my, my little pot is at 40, this pot it would be at 60, and my big one I set it right at 105 um, pounds. Doesn't mean I'm gonna fill it to that all the time. If I'm doing pin blanks in my big pot, if my other two pots are full and I'm doing pin blanks in it, you know, 50, 40, 50 pounds and you're fine. Uh, the other thing is if your pot is leaking a little bit, air, you need it to hold air that first if you're using aluminum like clear that sets in, in 45 minutes, you need it to hold uh, 40 pounds basically for 20, 25 minutes. At that point, it's so thick, you're not popping bubbles anymore. So what happens with pressure is you're blowing the bubbles up so small uh, that they're the size of a pinhead that you'll never ever see them. You're not, you're not um, getting rid of them. They're still there. They're just microscopic. So that's the, the, the theory with pressure. Uh, what else do we have? Yeah, we get a lot of, so, a lot okay. of feedback from members right now that they go in between themselves to discuss problems and situations and products and uh, stuff like that. And I'm, I'm glad you cleared up the thing about the Harbor Freight saving you money. Uh, saving you money might cost you your life. Right. So, you have to see if there's a, a trade-off on that. Absolutely. I'll say this about pressure pots. Um, California Air Tools makes one that is, uh, that's made for casting. It's already set up for resin casting. Uh, there's only one or two people out there right now that are actually making one that's set up from the factory for resin casting. The rest of them are set up for paint, uh, for paint spraying. So you're having to modify them right off the bat. Uh, and I can tell you that these Harbor Freight ones, they, uh, they don't pre-thread anything. <laughs> Literally, they don't. They, uh, they force thread everything in. So, and then they put pipe dope on it. So when you go to try to take stuff off to put your stuff on, I mean, it's, it's yeah, you've got everything in your and their brother trying to get these fittings off to do it. So it's a scary thing already. Um, yeah, I mean, it just is. Uh, also, keep your lids, if you're running pressure pots, keep them lubed up. This one hasn't been cleaned in a while. Um, keep them lubed up, though. I use Vaseline on the seals. Uh, I'll blow it off real good, take the seal out once a month or so. But I cast every day with these two, so. Uh, and then I'll re-Vaseline. If you're, if you're running your pressure pot uh, and you're filling it with air and you hear it ticking, literally ticking like a time bomb ticking Tick. that means that the seal is expanding to try to compress to to seal so it's time to, to add some vaseline to that seal and rejuvenate that rubber because you probably got a leak around your seal uh, if you got leaks and it won't hold air long enough then you can also spray all your fittings with with soap and water that old trick works uh, and you'll see bubbles with them so uh, let's talk about moles if we don't have many questions on pressure pots now. Um, um, one, one quick question. Um, you talked about getting a void, having a, it doesn't fill an internal void. So when you're turning, you may have to go back and refill. 
when right. you do that, do you do you have to put it back in the pressure pot or do you just uh, do it on the lathe? No, usually the holes are small then tiny. You're talking like the size of a big pin head um, that you're trying to fill a hole. You know, it's either a worm hole or an open eye. Let me show you. Let me see if I can find a piece of cotton wood for all here. Um, that you're trying to fill. Uh, so they're tiny. Here's a piece of cottonwood burl, and you can see these eyes here, uh, like this one is open. And I could take literally a, a little pinhead and stick it inside, and it doesn't go very deep, but it's an open eye. And those are the things on the surface that'll fill, that one would fill. But when if those eyes are inside as well and they're open like that, they won't fill, but they're tiny. So then I would be using, um, personally, uh, I do a lot of those holes just with CA, uh, super glue, thick super glue. I use thick for the most part. And um, obviously I have all these mica powders. That's what you see here behind us. Um, if it was a colored blank, uh, you know, and it's blue, then I would use some blue mica with my CA. So what I would do is I put the mica in the hole and then I drizzle either thin CA or I mix up some thick with some mica in it and just fill that hole with it. Spray it with activator and then five minutes later you're turning your piece. Um, that's my way that I fill a lot of open voids. If the, hole, if the hole is bigger then I would use like a 15 minute epoxy or you have to do multiple coats but of CA that answered that. Um, yeah, if you wound up with a big open hole inside, you could certainly put it back in the mold and recast it. But, uh, you know, if you're buying blanks from somebody and you don't have that capability, then CA or epoxy is your friend. Um, uh, will the epo so, will the epoxy cure out, outside of a pressure pot? Uh, so epoxies, they say, with most of these epoxies, they'll tell you that you don't need a pressure pot. Uh, I can tell you that that's a lot of hogwash. <laughs> so uh, they still have bubble problems and usually you're having to use heat to pop the bubbles um, and it's surface bubbles, but sometimes the bubbles can get pretty far in. Um, so ideally you're still using a pressure pot, um, even with them. The biggest disadvantage, I guess, of this resin, honestly, is cost. It's not cheap. A two gallon kit, basically, I think it's called a 16 pound kit. I haven't bought that in a while, but I think it's 180 bucks shipped, 160 plus shipping, something like that, um, for two gallons of resin. So that's quite a bit of money when you can get epoxy. Some of them you can get for, for 100 bucks for two gallons, so you save a little bit. But uh, to me, epoxies turn completely different. Um, they polish okay. Um, this resin is a little bit softer. It doesn't polish quite as well as epoxy or PR. PR is the best, it polishes just beautifully. But it's so brittle, uh, you drop a blank, a pin blank, and it probably, if it hit concrete, it probably shattered. So. Where this would just bounce off and you're, it's forgiving and you continue on. Uh, but the downside is that you have to really polish it out. You have to take your time more sanding and, and really polish with it. Uh, so also talking about set times, they say, you know, if you're using a clear, it's a one hour demold, or if you're using clear slow, it's a two hour demold. Okay, great. So I just pulled it out of the pressure pot. I uh, pull it out of my mold and I turn it. Absolutely, but you have to understand that they tell you also that if you read the specs, it fully cures in seven days or five days or something like that. So uh, that means literally it would be hard enough to start machining and working right out of the pot, uh, but polishing it is gonna be a little bit different uh, because it's really soft still until it completely, completely sets. Uh, for me, I, I can tell you that um, you know, within a day, I, I have no problems turning it and polishing it. But um, if you really wanted to, to have a full cure on it, uh, then you probably should do 
do a full week. You can also heat cure it. Some guys heat cure it. Uh, there's some specs on that from Alonolite too. Uh, they tell you 150 degrees for I think four or five hours or something. I don't remember now. Uh, and it brings it to full cure. So if you're in a hurry, that's always an option. Dane, we had a question come in for Bob about uh, would it make any, would it be more sensible to let it sit up five to seven days before you turn it? Yes. Just because it's going to, you're going to have a better, easier time with your finish on it. Uh, so talking about finishes on plastic too, uh, if you're just turning a pepper mill out of a plastic blank, so out of this resin, and there's no wood in it, no burl in it, nothing else in it, it's just resin, then I would not put a finish on this at all. I would literally sand it to 600 grit, and then I would start wet sanding, and I use a product called Zona Paper. Um, it's, a, it's Zona Polishing Paper, and compared to Micromesh, Micromesh, you can't get into tight grooves. Uh, it's on a foam board where this zone of polishing paper is very flexible and you can get into tight, tight grooves. And then I would wet sand with it and go through their six grits um, completely. And then after that, when I'm done, I use McGuire's plastic polish. It's called Plastex. That's and I apply it on the lathe with just my finger. And it's my final buff out, basically. And you can find um, that at the auto parts store because it's made for cleaning your headlights on. on absolutely. It's made to polish plastic. So uh, I apply it with my finger and it's, it's a wax basically with some grit in it that breaks down. Um, the more you rub it, the more it breaks into finer grit. So the more it polishes. Um, and then just wipe your finger off occasionally as you're going. I, I apply it on just, the, just enough speed that I'm not slinging the stuff off. So if you're slinging it off, slow your lay down. Um, okay. Bob, can, can I take a little break here for just one moment? Sure. Uh, because it's the top of the hour, and I have to let folks know that you're watching Worldwide Wood Turners. It comes on every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time. We crank up the whole work set about uh, 6.30 to let folks uh, come in and chat and, and talk with us and explain what, you know, problems uh, are they have or if they want to um, um, show a piece or ask a question. And also have to mention that what I'm reading right now on my screen are the questions that are coming into us on the chat. And the chat is on your screen. You can put in the chat and you can ask anybody that's in here tonight, 80-something people in here tonight, a personal question or a you know, private question and call it, or you can ask the entire group, or you can tell one of the co-hosts that's watching different parts of this that you have a gallery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if you want to participate, it's real simple. Go to our website, worldwidewoodturners.org. Got to keep saying it that way because I get calls about it. And you will find the information you will need and want to be part of our program. And it is your program, and we want you to involved here so um that's where we head now uh bob is doing something on casting and this is the first in a series we won't do them all one after the other we had trey in here a little bit while ago and he talked about making christmas ornaments for our challenge that's ongoing right now but uh with that we're going to go right back to bob again bob uh come on back with me sure uh so uh going back to using this resin uh, one of the downfalls to this, to any kind of urethane resin, which there's the two that I know of are Loom Light Clear and Loom Light Clear Slope. When you do use them, uh, they're very moisture sensitive. <clears throat> so you can't have any moisture at all in any item that you're putting in the pot or in your, in your, in your cast, uh, which means that uh, even surface moisture from the humidity in the air is too much moisture. You have to dry the blanks. Uh, at the very bare minimum, you have to dry them. To dry them, it's a pretty simple process. You get them down to your um, your equal equilibrium for your your area, your altitude, uh, where you're at, and 
uh, your EMC con, you're, you get it down to that equilibrium, anyhow. So anything that's above, for me, I know my equilibrium, the stuff that's been on my shelf for two years in this environment um, that wasn't green to start with, it was dry already, and it's been sitting here, it's probably about 17, 18% for me. And we're in a desert climate state, so that's what my moisture reader would read. So at that point, I know I can cut it into my blanks and I'm not gonna have a lot of shrinking uh, when I do the next step or I'm not gonna have a lot of cracking happening in the next step. If I try to take a piece of green wood or something that's 40% moisture and do the next step with it, you're gonna get all kinds of things happening, cracks and um, uh, wood movement, twists and warping and everything else going on in your piece. So I let these all sit here for months, literally drying. And then when I know that they're down to that EMC content um, or EM area, 16%, 17% for me, then I can cut them into smaller pieces that would fit into my mold. Um, for example, this piece would go into one of our, uh, one of these blanks. And I would cut it to the size I want it, and then I would take it up and put it, I use an electric smoker for, to, for mine, personally. Um, you can use toaster ovens, um, but you gotta keep it away from the burners, obviously. Uh, it has to be at least a few inches away from every burner. I have a dedicated electric smoker that I use for it, um, and I, I keep it set basically at uh, around 220 degrees, although at my altitude, they say 205-ish is boiling, and I wanna be at boiling temperature or above. Um, and I will load my oven up with plenty of air throw, airflow on all the racks, on the pieces already cut to size, and then I would run it for 24 hours. And then I personally will pull any of the pieces that I thought were the wettest or the heaviest uh, or the biggest, put it that way. Um, and I pull them one at a time out of the oven after 24 hours, I put them on a scale and I weigh them down to the ground. And I write the weight on the bottom of the blank of the piece, put them back in and I'll go, I go usually four or five, six more hours minimum pull those same pieces back out, reweigh them. If they lost weight, they lost moisture. They have to go back in. And you repeat that over and over and over until your, your biggest pieces or your wettest ones that you started with um, don't lose any more moisture. Once they quit losing weight, they'll quit losing moisture. Uh, so now we know that they're air dry completely down to 0%. Uh, any of your moisture meters that you guys have are only good down to 3, 4, 5% and then they will just read zero. So they're, they're not accurate enough for this at all. You can't use them. You have to, the only way to do it is weight. So drying them at above boiling temperature to actually boil that water off is the way you do that. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Once they're dry, and I know that then the, everything else should be dry that's in there because the pieces are smaller and they weren't as wet going in. Then I pull them out and I have big, big, the big bags. Um, you can get industrial size Ziplocs that are heavy duty. Um, I buy them just at the grocery store, but I buy the best ones I can get. They're literally, um, I think 16 or 18 inches wide by 16 or 18 tall. And I double bag them, I use two bags, one inside of the other, because I'm doing burrow with sharp edges. Um, one bag inside the other, and then I put all my pieces in there. And you have to do that while it's hot. Uh, so wear gloves or whatever so you don't burn yourself, but it has to go in while it's hot. If I don't do it while it's hot, literally 30 minutes later, it's already absorbing moisture out of the air. It's trying to get back to equilibrium or equal, whatever that is, so equal moisture for that that spot. So drying them, getting them in that bag right away uh, is important and get it sealed up. Get as much air as you can out and get it sealed up. Now it's good to go. It can sit in that bag on my shelf for, for a year if it wants to. I'm not worried about it then. But, um, or it can go right in and once it's cooled off 
uh, enough to handle, I could put it right in my mold and, and cast it without problems. Bob got a question online here. What about food dehydrators? Food dehydrators won't, won't get the, all the moisture out. Uh, the only way to get it all out is to get it above boiling temperature. So you have to boil it off. Food dehydrator will evaporate the, the surface moisture off of it, um, but it won't, it won't take it much past that. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, when you're casting your pieces and you pull them out, they have a skin on them. So this has a skin on it. It hasn't been trimmed off. I guarantee you that if I was to trim it off, and it wouldn't be this color, it would be blues, but there was going to be all kinds of detail in this blank. So you can't go by what's on the outside. You'll never tell what's inside of this until you actually cut into it. Uh, so I cast all our blanks in bigger blanks, and then I trim a, basically a sixteenth off of every side so that you can actually see what's inside. Uh, this could have burl hiding in it, and I would never know it until I trimmed it. That's that skin that gets on it, so keep that in mind. Now, once I trim it, if I see bubbles along this burl line, that's moisture from inside the burl. If you see foaming, that's a lot of moisture from inside the burl. Or it could be moisture from your air compressor. So I use a moisture trap. Um, you gotta keep all the all the moisture out. This stuff is just extremely sensitive to it. So that's okay. the biggest. We have another question about what about infusing wood with cactus juice? Sure. So stabilizing and casting are two different things. You must understand that. Uh, stabilizing does not fill pores. Stabilizing takes soft, punky stuff that you can dig your fingernail into, like this piece. That's really not something that you could mount on a lathe and turn because it's so soft it, it would just it'd have all kinds of tear out. So stabilizing with this piece is going to turn it into, it's going to help plasticize the piece. Basically it impregnates it with a plastic and once cured that plastic turns hard. But is what it's doing is it's getting in the fibers, the fibers will absorb it and then when you heat cure it, uh, so in the vacuum chamber it sucks all the air out you let off the vacuum, it pulls all the, the whatever you're using for your stabilizing liquid in, and then uh, you let that set for a period of time. We can do one on stabilizing too if you'd like another time. In the future, but, yeah. What's that? In the future, we will do that, please. Sure, sure. So uh, then you take it and cure it, and it turns it hard. Now, uh, you can see this one has cured cactus juice on the outside of it, just a little bit. Um, so that's typical, you get this buildup on it. And if you put it in foil, uh, you'll have a layer of plastic on the bottom from it drip out. So uh, the object of this for us, I stabilize everything that I cast. If you have the capability, do it. It's important. And the reason it's important is this. So <clears throat> this piece of burl, if I hadn't stabilized it, uh, say I was able to turn it, it was hard enough that I could turn it. It was solid enough piece that I could have turned it. Great. So I turn it, I, I actually uh, cast it, I turn it, and everything's great. I go through all the process of finishing it, doing whatever my finish is on it. And because it wasn't stabilized, if I didn't stabilize it, is what will happen is with heat or with moisture, um, in different, different, for example, how do I say that? If I take it from a dry climate to a humid climate, it's going to expand and you'll actually feel that joint. You'll feel the burl line. And if I go to a dry climate, it's going to shrink and then it's possible of cracking and it's still going to, you're going to feel that joint, even though it's finished, it's absorbed it absorbs and it expands or it contracts with the moisture from the air. So stabilizing it 
helps keep that from happening. This was turned, like I said, two years ago, and you can't feel that line. Um, so that's an important step for a finished turning of top quality, in my opinion. There and are some exceptions to that. Bob, got one more item. Uh, sure. Can you use a vacuum pump to get the moisture out? Uh, no. Vacuum won't pull moisture. It can't, it can't vaporize it. It's too solid. Okay. See, they're paying attention, Bob. Keep, we got a, just a moment or two to go if we can. Sure. Just talking about burl real quick. This is red mallee or brown mallee burl. And uh, any of the malleys or any of the Australian, most of the Australian timbers are so dense, they don't take much stabilization. They won't hardly gain any weight. So if you're gonna, if you don't have the process, the possibility of stabilizing something, but you want to cast burl, uh, I would recommend something like that. Something that's super dense. Um, Cause they, they're not gonna expand and contract with moisture. They're so dense, but let's feel questions. Any additional questions? We've been covering them as they showed up on chat. And I'll mention this again. Um, a lot of information you want, information you want is on our chat program. Before you leave tonight, press chat, save chat. If you do it any time before then, you won't save that didn't happen yet. Uh, Question, can, you Bob? Touch, can you touch on volume versus weight on mixing? Yes, absolutely. So with this resin, uh, it's mixed by weight. So um, I can tell you that when I get uh, a bottle of part A and a bottle of part B, when you look at them, when you get them right from the manufacturer, B side will have more liquid in it than the A side bottle will. That's because the B actually weighs more um, or less, however that works. So you have to actually add more to it. So the difference is uh, with this type of resin, you have to weigh it and it's a one-to-one -one mix. So if, if you're weighing, weigh it in grams, um, the smaller the pour, the more accurate you have to be. Uh, if I'm doing a large pour and I'm down to a gram, then I'm great. If I'm doing one single pin blank and I'm down to a gram, I, yeah, I may be pushing it. I might need to do tenths of grams even. Um, to get that harder ratio right. Are you using something like a, a postal scale? Yeah, so I, I actually, you can get just a cheap gram scale. Um, I use this one and it's covered in resin, but this one's nice because it has a flip top and I actually have, because my hands are always in resin. So I can keep the screen clean uh, and in this I just dispose of and throw away after a while. Um, but it's a top of the line scale and they're only, it was only like 40 bucks, but you can get the little cheap gram scales. Um, just make sure it's going to do the biggest pour you need it to do. And if you're going to do pin blanks, I would even try to get it down to 10th gram. Okay. Any other questions for Bob? If not, I can talk about moles if we have any time left at all, but. Oh, was, Bob was supposed to wrap up for 830 and I know we got a couple of, uh, folks out there that want to get in and chat a little bit, but you did great, man. We really do appreciate what you shared. Now we're going to put you on the hook. We can come back to you again for more, right? Sure. Absolutely. Anytime. All right. There's a lot more, there's a lot more involved with this, especially with moles and talking about different uh, dyes versus pigments versus micas um, and moles, soft moles, hard moles. I mean, there's a lot of difference there as well. Cheap moles, one-time moles versus versus actually spending money on uh, an expensive mode that you're going to use over and over. So, Okay. Well, thank you, Bob. I very much appreciate it. And Bob's information for contact is on our chat screen. So if you save chat, you'll be able to get that information. Uh, thank you, Bob. We'll see you again next time, sir. Sure. Any questions, reach out to us. Hey, right. Eddie, Doug Rowe here. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. We have the king of cardboard um, demonstration of cardboard uh, molds with us now. Uh, <laughs> I do like my cardboard molds. Hey, right. I, I don't mean to sound like the safety police here, but I just, I really want to stress that blow off valve because I know some of you are getting excited and you're going to go to Harbor Freight and you're going to buy that pressure pot and you're going to build one. I know because I did it. Um, but being in the military, I also understand making booby traps. 
And I promise you, if you do not have the correct blow off valve on that pressure pot, you just built a bomb. Absolutely. And you're going to blow that lid off. You're going to hurt yourself or at a minimum, you're going to break things in your, in your shop or out in your garage or wherever you just filled that pot up with pressure. So please, please, please understand what the blow off valve is there for. And that is so it opens up and lets the pressure out when you were too dumb and walked away from the air compressor or something distracted you and the air compressor is still filling it up with air, whatever. Um, please, the blow off valve if you're going to build one. That's all Absolutely. I got. It. And never, ever exceed your pressure that's rated for that pot. And if you don't know, if you don't trust it, 40 pounds. Yeah. That's all you need. Just Play 40 safe. pounds, just stay with that. Play safe. We want to have you back tomorrow. All right. Um, do we have any gallery on it, folks lined up right now? Because we've got some things to talk about. Last week uh, in the newsletter, I put a photograph of wig stands done by one of our team members. And he did 52 stands for a, um, a home or a center for children who's lost their hair due to chemotherapy. Um, I got something in today from Joe Lesko, L-E-S-K-O, with the Rocky Mountain Wood Turners, um, who said that his club does that. Exactly. They make it like a program. You've heard of Beads of Courage. Uh, or if you haven't, you really should know about Beads of Courage. It's a thing really pushed by a lot of organizations, including SWAT and I believe AEW and a couple of the others. Um, and it's a great program. But, you know, we can expand that program a little bit and the, the wig stands work. And also, I got a note in today, a guy, get, I wish I could print that and put it up here, a troop that got one of your pens. This troop got one of your pens through Doug, the first sergeant, a couple of weeks ago. And he sent a really nice note in saying, thank you so much. He took it with him to the sand. <coughs> That's what he writes home with every day. Um, and it's an important part of his life. And he thanks you for being involved. So if you want to turn a freedom pen, where do people send it to? We will get them to Doug Rowe. Doug Rowe gets them to the troops. And uh, we we will help them out. That's part of the programs we're involved in. Um, I, I, oh, I was looking for items for the Christmas ornament challenge. Got to remind you about that, uh, which is ongoing right now. Goes on to the first, or I think election day. I had to stop it on a day. We stopped it on election day. Uh, we'll stop it then. Um, but I was looking for samples of things to show you about ornaments. So of all places, I went to Pinterest, P-I-N-T-E-R-E-S-T, -E -E and clicked in Christmas ornaments. You gotta go there. You really do. Not only Christmas ornaments, chucks, jigs, rigs, knobs. I mean, it, all right, they don't tell you how to do it, but it gets this working a little bit. It gets you thinking about it. If I can do that, um, I, I if he can do that, I can do it. That's my daddy's slow thing when I grew up. See that guy? He's a he's the electrician. He's no sharper than you are. You become the electrician, plumber, and all this other stuff. He's absolutely right. Uh, we all have inborn talents, but we all can develop talents. So if you want to go to Pinterest and see what's there, be ready to copy pictures. Be ready. Click on it with the right the right mouse and say save as and put it on your desktop or wherever you need to. And uh, get that, can we have really great pieces. Uh, Doug Miller's got a couple of pieces if we got a little time. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see if I can get Doug in here. Doug, if you talk to me, we will get you. You came in late. Yes, sir, here I am. I'm right here. There, Doug, I got a couple of photographs from you this week. And I got to tell folks, yeah, if you've got a piece you've done, you finished, of course you're proud of it, it's yours. Um, <laughs> send it on to us. And we will show it. Doug, what you have tonight? Well, one, I think I, I sent this one to you. This was a, a cherry bowl blank that uh, I, I've been watching a fellow over on YouTube who got kind of tired of doing bowls. And he started doing hollow forms. I thought, well, you know what? I've only done bowls for about three years now. And so I decided I'd make a, a another hollow form. I had one for you last week. But this one's just a little different. Did this uh, uh, faux 
inset piece on that, uh, but it's uh, just a, a cherry bowl blank that I made a hollow form out of it. It's relatively thin. The outside's all done with a bowl gouge inside with uh, carbides, including a hook tool that got me all the way back into here. It's the, this side over here is just about as thin as this top is. Now, now I just heard from Paul from uh, Paul Barn just now that you Dugs are, are starting to take over the wood turning world. Is, <laughs> is, that, is that a plot with you guys? Uh, maybe. Oh. <laughs> then I had a another one. Um, this is a, a a board, actually a cherry board that I got from Woodcraft. I made some uh, offering boxes for a couple of churches, and this was a an extra piece from that. Um, it was uh, seven eighths of an inch thick, so I turned a, a nice shallow platter out of some figured cherry. I had a, a little natural void in it. That's a knot that fell out, and so it came out to be a nice character piece right there on that edge. Lots right, of I gotta say this, Jason. Pay attention. You can leave those knots in the stuff because Jason came to us and and Mark Soleil tried to help him out with saving a piece. That's nice save. Yeah, I, it was there, and uh, I could have removed it. I could have done it the other direction. If I'd have made this side the bottom and this side the top, I would have gotten rid of that. But I chose to leave it in there just for a, a character piece. Character, so that's where we're going. That uh, curly cherry just came out to be a, a real pretty piece. It is. But then there, I was looking around the other day, and I found a, a piece of cherry 4x4. Four four. It came from a reclamation Place. They reclaim old wood from uh, pallets and whatnot. And uh, one of the pieces I picked up the day I was there was a piece of cherry, four by four. It's about, uh, oh, I guess it was about two and a half, three feet long. And I started to turn it uh, uh, to make a vase. And there was a, uh, a uh, bark inclusion that ran all the way through, right, almost right in the center. And so before I even got it completely around, I turned it the other direction so that the, the ends were sticking out more like a wing. And I came up with that little jewel. There you can see the bark inclusion, how it runs through the bottom there. What oh, voids were in it, I filled with coffee and CA glue. <laughs> One of the interesting things is that coffee acts as, a, as an accelerant for CA. So you put your coffee grounds in there, drizzle your thin CA over it, and it will smoke up on its own pretty quickly. Yeah, wear your respirator or go outside, one of the two. Absolutely, absolutely. Beautiful work, Doug. Appreciate you joining us this evening. Uh, yes, folks, that's our gallery portion. And if you have something to show, you put it in the chat. Dane will see it. Dane will let us know. I'm peeking at the... Uh, at the chat thing tonight because a lot of stuff happening uh, behind the scenes with Bob with some input, Paul Barn was in, Paul Barn was in. Um, I see Kim has been in there this evening a little bit. So we have a lot of folks to get involved in casting and, and, and acrylics that we're relying on to give us demos. And I'll say it again, we're looking for your work. So if you like demo, yes, sir, I hear you. How about Mark Soleil? He's got something probably for us tonight. Mark will have, uh, uh, all right. I'm, I've tapped in Mark once or twice and it didn't come in. But now I know why. Hey, Mark. Hey, good evening. Yeah, I, uh, um, I didn't bring anything up here to show you tonight, but uh, uh, I'll be happy to do a little demonstration on tenantless joinery if, you're, if the people are interested. So that, that means that if you're going to do uh, solid ornaments, hollow ornaments, or irregularly surfaced ornaments, you don't need a tenon to do the joinery. And that way there'll never be a gap where you join irregular surfaces. So what I can do is I can make up 50 or 60 finials and I can interchange them in any, any different uh, ornament that I make uh, because there's no tenants and uh, I'll be happy to do a little demo on that. We'd like to set that up in the schedule sir. Uh, Ronnie handles that. Uh, now can you do this with two by four Mark? <laughs> I can do it with anything. 
Okay. Well, well, we we that's what I use uh, a fender, or a fender, but we can do it with the two by fours, and uh, and I can, uh, I, you know, another thing I can do while you got your little Christmas ornament thing going. Uh, it takes me less than four minutes to turn a Christmas ornament out of a two by four, and I'll show you how to do how I do a snowman. I can show you how I do the bells. I can show you how I do my Christmas trees. I can show you how I, I, I just make hundreds of different styles of ornaments out of two by fours. Well, and that's they all take they all take less than four minutes. All right, we'd like to see that too. Uh, you know, we're talking about two, uh, uh, Christmas ornaments. I got my buddy in Ocean Springs with us right now, and he he poked something up on the screen. What's up? good, Johnny? That's that's one I learned from Mark there. The uh, but that's all it is. That's pine too. So yep. Ronnie goes. The, uh, I'll appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, piece of pine. All right. Uh, for those that came in, you know, if you don't know the back story, we'll let you know. Ronnie, just like I did in in, in early days of turning, uh, Ronnie discovered two by four. And if he's going to do something and he wants to practice a shape or practice a cut, um, he will do it on two by four. But he turns out some really nice work out of it. But when I say practice it, you know, two by four it does not have the grain structure to do a lot of what we like to do. Well, that's where you learn how to slice. That's how you learn how to do finer cuts. And you put the plow away and you get out the knife. So. Well, you learned that from the master, Mark Salade, eh? I, yeah. I get it. Eddie, let's go to Matt Harbor. Matt, Matt, can you stay talking? Yep, I can. I'm right here. Um, I'll lower my hand. Uh, first of all, I've got some, a few Christmas ornaments. These are, the finials are made just out of straight up maple and uh, then dyed with spirit stain. And the, the, the shells are sea urchin ornaments sprayed with metallic silver paint, acrylic paint. And this is, this is fishing line on the top that's put through a hole in the, in the, in the top. That's nice. Yeah, now you this can lock is, those up and lock them away so nobody else sees them, right? Yeah, <laughs> these are the only ones that haven't sold. <laughs> Uh, uh, let me ask you something. Yes, sir. Is it supposed to be like that or turn the other way? You know, it, it's your piece. I like them this way. I've seen people turn them upside down. Here's the thing. The, the, this, this end has got the small hole on it, so that's the one I wanted up top. Okay. So I could make a bigger, a bigger base down here at the bottom. Well, I had a couple and I made them and the wife said, you know, you made those all upside down. Uh, well, that's a quilter. Yeah, that's that's an eye of the beholder sort of thing. So, you know. I have a you. question. I have a question for Matt. Yes, sir. How do you fasten the top and bottom finials on there? Do you run a rod all the way through? Yeah, there is there is a an eight inch dowel between the two. So when I'm okay. turning them, th there's a, there's an eighth inch cav a cavity in, in in the bottom icicle for the dowel to sit in. And then there's an eighth inch hole all the way through the top finial. And that's how you get the, that's how you get the fishing line in it is you put that in and then you stick the dowel in and glue it in and then you stain it all. Okay. Thanks. So, and, and the, the sea urchin ornament is filled with that uh, expanding uh, uh, insulation foam, the great stuff stuff. So you fill this, so it, it's a lot more stable. It acts like a glue and keeps it from breaking. Okay. Yeah, it's the floor. Okay. It's the floor. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I got I got a few other things if I may. Can mm. I share my can I share my screen real quick? Um, I think I have it set up to do that. Yeah, let me just show you. This is a snow one of many snowman I did last fall. He's about 13 inches tall. And I turned him with the natural edge uh, on the hat. The hat and the bottom are two different pieces. This is done in the Holly Denny style. Uh, the nose is just it's a I think it's a quarter inch dowel you buy them from from the hobby store and then I have a little sanding mandrel on the lathe and I just sand the ends off and paint them orange that's nice thank you so that's fun um, let me stop that and let me show you there's a few other things my, my club I'm in the Detroit area my club is the Detroit area wood turners and we have been doing online meetings since March maybe or maybe April 
And our, our demonstrator last month was uh, Harvey Meyer, and he demonstrated doing these, these, these boxes. And this is a box, he calls it an OG box. And I did some embellishment on the inside and put some wax in it. But this was a lot of fun. I learned a lot making this. And this is a sycamore and some scrap mahogany I had in the shop. I got the sycamore from somebody's burn pile. So if I go to your house and you've got a wood burning wood wood pile by the fire pit, I'm going to go look through your wood pile. <laughs> I don't I don't blame you. Yeah, um, and I make a I make a lot of I make a lot of goblets. So this is one I finished the other day. This is oak. So nice. And I do a lot of natural edge stuff. So that's cedar. Red cedar. And one of the things that I teach is I teach um, how to how to offset things so you get some funky. Uh, I have a piece handy that does that, but so you can get you can get a sort of a winged piece. Get a, a, a if you're working with natural edges, you can get a wing piece going. Um, and, and I like them that way. I like them. So if you're doing natural edge, I like the 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 bark and and a sort of a you know a piece that looks like it's been windswept or something. <laughs> And then I had some, uh, I fell into some, some hard maple board. So I turned, I turned some small platters out of it. And then I was experimenting with airbrushing and gesso and carving it in the Al Sturt sort of way. So just some playing around with scrap wood, scrap board. So that's okay. what I had. That's my last week. Doesn't work. Al Sturt's work, you're doing good. Thank you. He keeps swearing at us. What's that? You can't yes. swear at thirty words crap. <laughs> I, I saw that. I got the A. Paul Barnes said that. You know, it's a dirty word. We're, there is no scrap wood. It's just wood we haven't gotten the turn to it yet. Yeah, scrap is wood that, that I use for something else, and it's just laying around the shop waiting for an opportunity. Right. <laughs> so Eddie, let's jump to uh, Billy Bird. He's got something. Billy, you're up, sir. Talk a little bit so I can find you. Okay. Can you see me? Yep. All right. I was, for, I don't know if some of you probably saw this. Uh, many of you probably saw Gord Rock's uh, donut challenge a couple of months ago. Uh, I did this little donut. Oh, oh but if Kim sees that, you're going to have company. <laughs> I know. But is, this is ash juniper, the body of the donuts, ash juniper, and I hollowed it. Uh, I hollowed it in halves, and then I glued it together and uh, turned a little oak platter for it because my wife said it needed to be on a little platter. Uh, it was a great, and it was a great idea. And the, the, the icing, the frosting on it, or the glaze is, uh, uh, crap, I just lost it. it. Anyway, it's made by Alumalite. It's the white Alumalite, the fast set stuff. I mean, and this is fast. It sets up in like five minutes. So I just I just poured some of it on the top and boom. That, it was. So that is so cool. That is. Very and uh, I did this little jewel, uh, just playing around with some, the green and the white pieces in here are cargo strapping that came on my new Powermatic 2014. <laughs> and I thought, hey, let's put those in resin. Uh, this is another piece of ash juniper inside. Uh, runs all the way through. All right, Billy. Uh, Paul, Paul, and I'm done. Paul Barnes says uh, that is, wait, what's the product? I, I saw it just now. Um, Alumalite White. Alumalite White. Yeah, I think it's called Amazing Crast, uh, Amazing Casting Resin or Amazing, yeah, something. Anyway, it's, you can guy, get it on Amazon for little or nothing. Yeah, Amazing. Hobby Lobby sells that stuff too. I've been using. Yes, that. it's a it's and, a little light product. You're right. Right, yeah. but it it's quick. Thank you, Billy. Um, and and let, let's mention when you're doing the ornaments, if you're really tight and you can't find, I'm tight. Okay, uh, if you're really tight and you're having a problem finding right wood, think about Hobby Lobby, et cetera, et cetera. They have doll material uh, in their wood section. Pardon me. And they'll have it from one eighth up to inch and a half or two inch. That is split wood, which means the grain is running right down the wood. Uh, it won't snap off, not a lot of knots and stuff, because they can't sell that. 
So if you're looking for something to do Christmas ornaments, and I cheat that way, I get a three quarter inch piece, chuck it up, put it in, and I can get about three or four ornaments out of each piece when I piece them off and just reshape it. So it's a way to cheat a little bit to get something started, especially if you got a problem with that getting round stuff, uh, which a lot of us do. And if we are over time right now. And got we, one, more, one, again, more gallery. one more for gallery. All right, you can handle it. What you got? Okay. Patrick Hogart, North Carolina. Go ahead, Patrick. Okay, you got me? Yes, sir. Hey, Patrick. Okay, you got a piece of walnut hollow foam and did a little playing around with putting a foot on the bottom of it and I used the indexing on the lathe and drilled these parts out with uh, I can't remember the name of the bit now. Forstner bit? Forstner bit and then took a dremel and kind of cleaned it up a little bit. Okay. And I got one more. Hey, That's Pat, Pat, what did you finish? The bottom of your feet, it looks kind of silvery and metallic. What's up with that? It's just the finish. Thanks. Nice work. It's um, finished with lacquer. And I got this little hollow form I did uh, playing around with a little bit of inlay, and it's got copper and turquoise inlay. That's nice. I like the inlay. I do. Cool. That's it. All right, sir. Thank you so much for sharing with us tonight, Patrick. Um, ooh, there was, I think I had one or two more things. Oh, I've got to remind you that there's a lot of information on our chat screen tonight. And like the Illuminite White is also known as Amazing Casting Resin that Paul Barn just put that up. And we've heard from a lot of folks. We share this information, folks. We share it all. If you'd like to get what's on the chat, if you press chat in the bottom right-hand corner, just about the bottom right-hand corner, there's a square with three little dots. Click on that and click save chat, and you'll have it. Now, I saw the one or two folks videotaping what was happening on the screen with their cell phones. Uh, I imagine that's to, for them to use later on. We're still working with our, our website director, uh, and mainly it's me. If we have a glitch and I lose connection, I can't go back and get the video. Uh, it's gone. So we're going to work on the future of having the co-host capable of video of copying the video. And then for some way, we will get the information to our website. So if you miss a program, you didn't really miss a program. You got to you lost, you lost a chance to lie about your work. That's a, you know, that's pretty much it. And uh, Doug Rowe is plugged back in. He says he's been in the chat before and given up his address, and I can provide it to you if you get a lot of pins to send our troops. Uh, if you've got one or two, send them on to me. I'll forward them on to Doug. Um, I play with a little bit. And, you know, but um, and his pens are now, his address is now on the chat. You can't beat that for service, folks. You can't beat that. Um, and you can send them directly to Doug and he will put them in the hands of the working troops, the people that preserve our freedom, our rights. And, uh, we have to consider that sometimes. Um, if you consider what they do for what they get paid, you'll change your attitude about them a whole lot. Well, we're going to wrap up this week, folks. We're going to call it a night cause it's a little bit past the night. I'm captain Eddie Castle with all my co-hosts and all my staff. Um, all these people put this together for you as volunteers. And if you'd like to be part of the program, send me an email to our email address, worldwidewoodturners at gmail.com. It's worldwidewoodturners at gmail.com. If you didn't write that down, go to our website. There's an information link or a contact link. Dave's got it all worked out. And that's where he's got some videos and all this other stuff. And on behalf of all these folks that work so hard to give you a great show tonight, I thank them, and I thank you for being part of our program. Remember, we're not a club. We're a gang. Is that right? Okay, we're a gang. <laughs> Y'all take care. I'll see you back again next Wednesday. Invite a friend. Remember, we, we, we don't make any money unless your friends come in. Hey, Eddie, um, 
suggestion, and this came out from Lucid Wood Turners, when you're recording a su recording, record it in like a 15 minute section. So if you, if you do lose the connection, you've only lost a 15 minute section of it and not the whole video, not the whole uh, evening. I need to find out how to do that. It's not in the book. Okay. Uh, um, but, but that's how he does it. He keeps it in smaller sections and then pieces it back together. So if he loses something, he's lost part of it, but not the whole thing. Good. Thank you. See, sharing information, it never stops here. In other words, Eddie, my job is doubled. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Ron. Ronnie, I was uh, <clears throat> going to mention that he's the executive director of membership management. Is that it? Membership and time clock. Membership and time clock. That's it. Y'all want to give you a heads up on what time it is? That's Ronnie. Beeping me right here on my device. Tell me it's time to rock and roll. And with that, we're down to probably about 50 folks. You have to go home. You really do. Oh, wait, you're home. <laughs> I'll there see you all next week. Take care. Be good. And above all else, thank you. Now I'm going to put. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. It was a good program. Thank you, sir. Good night, all. Thank, thank you. It was a great program.